Am I telling you anything you don't know? No, I'm not. For those of you who walked in the mall, you pass by those uh, little candle shops, and you're like, wow, there's got some nice odors coming out of it. You walk into the store, and you start smelling the candles. It's really nice. So they've got some really pretty smells in them, various aldehydes, maybe ketones. And what's happening right now? Well, you smell them, but they're mostly, most of these odorants are inside the candle. They're held fast. And the reason why they're held fast is because it's a solid. And because it's a solid, they're not diffusing out. You want them to diffuse out, what do you do? You light it. So if I had a candle up here, maybe York and Mark would be able to smell it. But for the people in the back, I'm going to have to light this candle. In five minutes, everyone in this room is going to know exactly what odor is found in that candle. What did I do? I just changed the state. I went from a solid to a liquid state. The odorants now have an opportunity to release. So how long does it take to diffuse through the wax? It's not applicable. It doesn't apply. We're dealing with a solid. So reasonably, you could say it might take minutes under certain circumstances. It might take hours. There's literature saying that the pheromone sits for an hour and a half on the outside of the insects and scylla. This would seem to be supported by the physical evidence right now. And so this might take minutes to hours. Some of you might be saying, well, <laughs> your presentation's over, Tom. You're done. Your goal of one to 10 milliseconds has been completely blown out of the water right now, so why don't you just sit down? However, you can see I've got some other steps to go, and York hasn't told me to sit down yet. <clears throat> so what's our next step? The next step is time to diffuse through the pores. Well, it has to diffuse through the pores, but it has to get to the pores. This is a representative Sincilla trichodia from Bombyx mori, the silkworm. Can you see the pores? Maybe not. Let me point them out to you. One, two, three, four. This is drawn to scale. This is drawn to scale. So when the pheromone hits the Sincilla trichodia, most of them get stuck on the outside. Most of them don't go inside the pores, and therefore most of them are going to have to migrate in some way through a solid crystalline waxy layer. Borderline impossible. And so time to diffuse through the pores unknown. No one's ever actually looked at anything like that before. What about the time to bind a pheromone? What's the process there? Well, fortunately, this has been looked at a little bit more. The pheromone binding protein binds uh, very well to the pheromone. You put the pheromone binding protein and the pheromone together and they will become a couple like that. So that's not a problem at all. That'll occur in about one millisecond. So we're doing pretty good there. Time to transport the pheromone. Now remember, it's not the pheromone that I'm transporting. It's the pheromone and the pheromone binding protein because it's a complex. And because it's a complex, that's a big molecule. The bigger the molecule, the slower the diffusion. So that's what I'm going to have to transport to the other side. So I hit the literature. 1993, Brun and Kim have a nice uh, article that I can look at and make some extrapolations from, predicting protein diffusion coefficients. For those of you who may not be aware of this, you have two diff diffusion coefficients. One is in air, the other is in water. So I'm interested in the one in water because that mostly closely resembles what I'm looking for. So I take a look, is it a rod or is it a globular protein? Mine's a globular protein, it's about 14 kilodaltons, diffuses across my sensillar space. I find out, according to the literature, it's going to take about 10 to 12 milliseconds for that complex to make it across that space to the dendrite. And boy, did I make some big mistakes right now. Let me point them out to you, for those of you who are not aware. These are some of the mistakes. I made some invalid assumptions with that. One, can I make a linear extrapolation? The diffusion is a two-dimensional molecule. Can I uh, make a linear extrapolation to three? No. That there is a diffusion gradient. I'm assuming that there's a diffusion gradient, and there is not a diffusion gradient. There is a much higher amount inside than there is outside, so that's blown out of the water. I'm assuming that there's a pure water solvent. It's not pure water. There's a lot of stuff in there, and it is not pure water, and therefore it becomes more like a gel, as that individual of last month told me about. Two, I assume that no bound water molecules occur to the PBP, or the pheromone binding protein. Well, they do. I assume that there's no dendritic sheath. Yes, there's actually a sheath surrounding the dendrites. That's also a problem. How does the pheromone and the pheromone binding protein get through that? And I'm assuming that there's no change in temperature or viscosity over time. All invalid assumptions. So because I can't make this assumption, why am I making this assumption at all? Well, all I have to work with right now is 10 to 12 milliseconds. There's no way to work with anything else. So I'm just going to tell you right now, the time to transport the pheromone is going to be a minimum of 10 milliseconds. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care whether or not it actually takes 11 milliseconds 
or 100,000 milliseconds. I don't care. All I care about is that it's not faster than 10 milliseconds right now, and that I can make with some certainty. So uh, the time to dissociate from the pheromone. What about this? Has this been looked at? Fortunately, it has. Time to dissociate from the pheromone. How does this happen? Well, uh, we do know that it can dissociate, but there are some problems, as you might imagine. There's been problems throughout my entire talk. Here's some more. The problem is this. Once the pheromone binds with a pheromone binding protein, we got a classic pH of 7. It migrates across, simple to understand, and it binds to the purported receptor. Now it must dissociate. Well, how does it do that? Dissociation only occurs at a pH of 5. There is no separation between the pheromone and the pheromone binding protein. It binds strongly. It binds so strongly that the Germans, Carl Kaysen that I talked about right now, feels that it doesn't dissociate at all. He actually feels the whole thing as a complex gets there because it really cannot dissociate. However, Walter Leal, California, pH of 5. This is how it separates. Well, where is a pH of 5? Does anyone have a pH of 5 running through their blood? I hope not because you're not healthy. So where is the physiological pH? The pH of 5 is located right here along the membrane. So you must have contact with the membrane. Then the molecule recognizes it as being in a pH of 5 environment. OK. And then dissociation occurs. And then it makes its way to the uh, receptor. Well, this is a little difficult to swallow, but this is what's being uh, reported right now. And this occurs in 9 milliseconds. If we have a pH of 5. If we don't have a pH of 5, the half-life of dissociation is about 100 seconds. Not milliseconds, seconds. This will not separate. So do I go with the 9 millisecond figure? Doesn't really matter, as you can see right now. Or do I go with the 100 second figure? That's your choice. And time to activate the receptor. Well, that doesn't take long at all. Probably on the order of about 50 picoseconds. Uh, receptors activate pretty quickly, so that's not really a major problem in the uh, theory. But we're dealing with uh, something which is very, very quick, therefore significantly less than one millisecond. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and so some of you are not convinced. Why? Because you're the SSE. And because you're the SSE, some of you are skeptical. Some of you are not buying what I'm telling you right now. Some of you are convinced. Thank you. Some of you are not, but you're, you might be a normal run-of-the-mill skeptic, and that's fine. Uh, some of you might be a pathological skeptic, and I can't do anything for you. But for you, normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill skeptics right now, I want you to chew on this. Take a look at neurotransmitter uh, synaptic transmission. Let's take a look and find out how long this process takes, a process which has been known for decades and is exactly the same process that is being talked about in the insects. One, there's a major difference between the two. The synapse, the, the acetylcholine synapse that I'm talking about, there's type 1 and type 2 receptors. I'm talking about the one that's 20 nanometers long, is going to diffuse over the course of 20 nanometers. My insect is diffusing over the course of between 1150 to 2000 nanometers, close 1 to 2 micrometers. Well, that's a huge difference right now. That would seem to make a difference right there. But let's take a look at the time course of events. Arrival of the excitatory impulse. Again, we'll assign that at zero milliseconds. The binding of the vesicle to the membrane and release of neurotransmitter. We have got it down to between three to five milliseconds right now. So it's not faster than three, and it's certainly not lower than five. I think the, the resolution might be worked out a little bit better, and there may be some neurophysiologists who know more about this than I do, but we're at three to five milliseconds right now. Diffusion across the synaptic cleft, the 20 nanometers, and the binding of the neurotransmitter to the receptor, they have not been able to separate. Altogether, that's 0.3 milliseconds. Take home message. It takes 3.3 to 5.3 milliseconds for synaptic transmission. And you're telling me that an insect is smelling as fast as synaptic transmission. No, I am not buying that. So, one of my conclusions? Well, I think my conclusion should be obvious. Either the current theory of insect olfaction needs to be modified in order to include one or more mechanisms in addition to simple diffusion, because that's all I've got to work with right now, simple diffusion, or current theory needs to be replaced by a new theory that supports the electrophysiological or temporal data. That's all I wrote. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>